What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, the real Adam Coleman. And bruh, we we got we got a guest right here. I don't know how it took this long for, for me to get this man on the show. You know what I'm saying? We got a living legend right here, multiple nah, you know, time nah. author. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, we got pastor of Vision Church, man. No, seriously, man. I, I this is my brother, man. Yeah, I, this this right Absolutely. here. Um, yeah. you know, this show, uh, the last show we had Eric Mason on, man. This this is just brothers talking, man. I this is a guy I truly appreciate. I'm I'm really excited to have on the show for y'all to hear him. Pastor Jerome Gay is in the building on True ID. What's going on, bro? There, brother. Yes, sir, man. What's up, Adam? I'm I'm glad to be on. You definitely are, a brother. I appreciate your work for the kingdom with the apologetics that you do and the resources you put out. Congrats on the show, uh, blowing up, God breathing on the show. I pray you continue to get more subscribers so because you keep putting out great gospel centered content. So I'm glad to be on and hey, excited about you. today's, uh, excited about tonight's conversation. Oh, excellent, man. Excellent. Yeah, I, I definitely am too, bro. And you know, it's funny, man, uh, shout out to, to Zion McGregor, man. We was on a, um, a clubhouse, um, I don't know what you call them. It's not a show, but I guess they call them a meeting club. I guess they call them a clubhouse. I don't know what they call them. Yeah. But, uh, you know, we was on Clubhouse. Uh, he started a group uh, about, about urban apologetics. And, you know, one of the things that really struck me is that when you look at this, this urban apologetics movement is that, A, you see God moving rapidly. I mean, just, mm -hmm. you know, four or five years ago, I mean, you know, like we didn't know each other. I mean, there's so many of us who kick it on a regular now who were just yeah. in our own places seeing the same problems. And, you know, yeah. God just moved on each of our hearts in different ways to you know get in here and address it. And what's, what's powerful, man, is that not only is God bringing people together, but if you really look at the content that's coming out of this community, bro, like this is some on point stuff. This is not just, you know, fly by night stuff like we have some solid brothers and sisters you know what i'm saying who are putting out work of uh, you know uh, sound and orthodoxy and profound in their thinking man and i really think that the your new work uh the whitewashing of christianity is it really exemplifies that man so i'm excited to have you on here um you know talking about it um bro first of all just kind of you know let us let people know first of all maybe who you are i mean you are new to the channel so let folks know who you are and then also uh tell us a little bit about what what compelled you to write this book bro i mean it's, this is a profound stuff be about to get deep yeah, yeah, yeah. You know saying? but yeah, uh you know yeah, i want yeah, people yeah. to you know let's dip a toe in first you know what I mean? what, what, nah, yeah what yeah yeah so 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 yeah uh jerome gay first and foremost i am a son of yeshua that's my most important title a title amen. that was gifted to me i didn't earn that title by grace through faith not by works amen um i am a husband to crystal gay uh we can really celebrate 20 years of marriage Hey. I, am a, I am a father to uh, Jamari Christina Gay and Jerome Jordan Gay III, my namesake, and I am a pastor uh, to Vision Church, pastor of Vision Church. So, uh, but my first most important title was that of a son, son of Yeshua, Amen. and I go in that order. So, son of Yeshua, husband of Crystal, father to Jamari Jordan, pastor of Vision Church. Amen. Um, so that's 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 me in a nutshell. Um, but what compelled me to uh, for this resource man was. Uh, when we talk about, you know, the whitewashing Christianity, um, really, I always I always kind of go to the I go to the subtitle because um, sadly, but but I know people are going are going to literally judge a book by its cover and and assume it's true, it's true, assume right. assume that whitewashing is white bashing. That's furthest. That's the furthest from the truth. Uh, so if you read the subtitle, it's a hidden past. And so I want to deal with uh, Africans and Africa's contribution to the Christian faith, to philosophy, to theology, to apologetics, as many of the early African Christian theologians, philosophers, and martyrs were of African descent. And a lot of times this reality is hidden, it's hidden um, because of imagery. Uh, we, ha we have these, these African people being presented as white men and women, and that's a problem. And so what compelled me was not race, but evangelism. Because what, what I see happening, man, is we have people making an eternal decision based on erroneous information. But that erroneous information is presented as fact. And so when you just whitewash and by, by saying that, you know, you, you present a white Jesus, white 12 disciples, white Mary, white Joseph, and you just uh, white Africans, uh, Egyptians, like all, all of the imagery. And then you have people who are looking at our faith saying, Man, it seems like he he may save black and brown people, but he didn't use us. He doesn't care about us. And again, that's false. But we got to realize that as apologists, as evangelists, we got to deconstruct the things that attempt to eclipse the gospel in the minds and the hearts of people. And so as I'm seeing people turn away from the faith, 
I want to write about that. So I want to unpack that hidden past. Then I say a hurtful present. And I want to deal with the responses to whitewashing. Um, one being liberation. So I break down, you know, Cone's theology first so we can understand it, but then also aspects of his soteriology that we can't embrace. Uh, but then sure, also sure. self-hatred, self-hatred, where some some blacks and brown people have internalized whitewashing and right. they want to seek the affirmation of another culture as opposed to that of him. Well done from Yeshua. But even though all that's going on and we're unpacking centuries of whitewashing is a hopeful future. And so our hope is is in Christ and his gospel. It's not in, we're not, the answer isn't to blackwash the Bible. The answer to whitewashing isn't blackwashing. The answer is like, let's get to the gospel. And the gospel reveals the beautiful tapestry and mosaic of the people of God whom are saved by grace and through faith. And so evangelism, man, we want to impact lostness. And people, mm. all, all Christians should care about that. And the fact that to present the Christian faith in a monolithic and monocultural way is 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 false, it's misrepresentation, and it actually contributes to lostness. And so let's stop. The devil yeah. don't need no help. Let's let the devil don't need now, no help. So, now, so let's now, white, I don't mean stop. hey man, hold on. I don't mean to, I, I gotta wipe my face before I say that. I, I don't mean to cut you cut you off, man. I, I got a bone to pick with you, bro. You I, I need you to come clean, my dude. You know what I'm saying? You gave all this explanation about why you wrote the book and i need you to come clean that really what's behind it all is crt man i need you to come clean you know what i'm saying that really what this is you say you, you just pull from the crt playbook and just plagiarize that james and put it put a cover on it man <laughs> that's what that's what, nah man nah, nah but, you know, yeah you know, it's, it, it's amazing how how many it's just when you it basically if you use a racial term right you're mischaracterized as a proponent of critical race theory. Um, right. But those of us in the UF, UA community, urban apologetics community have consistently said, look, we don't embrace it. And my primary reason for not embracing it is because there's no redemption in it. There's no redemption. We've Thank been you. given the ministry of reconciliation, second Corinthians five. And so uh, I understand the historical aspects of it. I, you know, um, I, I understand and I get that but I want to come back to, hey, talking about race, talking about things that actually happen. And that, that's what this the revisionist right. history right. is crazy. Like yeah. this stuff happened. This is the, the you know, it happened and it wasn't handled well. Many evangelicals and many of them were white, dropped the ball on slavery, isogeted the text, isogeted mm -hmm. Genesis six, mm -hmm. dehumanized people. Uh, committed the sin that's in the book of John it was like you can't love God who you can see if you don't love your brother who you uh, who Come you can't see if you don't hear. So it's like like th this is what led me. So this this is yeah nothing, I, nothing, <laughs> nothing, this is not and I know I know you were saying it in jest. Yeah yeah. This is you, you know what I'm saying though. Man. I'm you not. A, I, I, I say it this way. I'm not okay. a critical race theorist. I'm a biblicist. Come I'm on, bro. A, I'm a biblicist. I I want us to walk out what the scriptures say. Right, right. No, I mean, no, you know, I'm joking, but I mean, at the same yeah, time. Yeah. I feel like we have to to address those kind of things because at yeah. the end of the day, if, if people play the tape back and they listen to why you wrote the book, what they're going to hear is a pastor. I'm saying you're going to hear somebody who has pastoral concerns. You're looking out your community. You're seeing people turn to whether it be the Hebrew Israelites, the comedics yeah. and so on and so forth, turn away from the true gospel in favor of these other ideologies. And at the end of the day, this book right here addresses you know, what's at the heart of many of their concerns, objections to Christianity and so forth. So ultimately this is a gospel issue. You know what I'm saying this is a matter of Absolutely. people turning away from the faith. And, you know, um, let's, let's be, be accused of, of not going to the text. If you look at second Corinthians six, I'm saying Paul is very clear. He said that, you know, yeah. we don't put, we don't give any occasion, you know, for there to be a stumbling block, you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, for, uh, so that the ministry will be blamed. And then he kind of lists all yeah. the kind of things that they did in order to keep themselves in good repute, if you will, you know, yeah. in, so, in so much as the church, particularly here in the Western world has failed to do so, there are stumbling blocks that mm -hmm. prevent people from knowing the true and living God, right? That, that, and that's just a fact of the matter. When you look at, uh, the, you know, the Bible talks about how the enemy of our souls blinds minds of folks so that they can't see the, the light of the glorious gospel. Well, you know, yeah. he, he, he blinds people's minds with deception. One of those deceptions exactly. being that God doesn't care about you and didn't have you in mind, you know, in the scriptures, didn't have you in mind as he unfolded, you know, the ecclesia throughout, you know, the course of history and so forth. You know, so we want to combat those things, man. But, you know, uh, I'm glad I'm glad you laid that out, bro. So I want to get a little bit deeper. I want to, you know, I want to kind of give you uh, some space to, to talk about what whitewashing is, 
Um, and you'll just really kind of, you know, lay that out and give us some examples. Um, and, and I know, I'm, I, you know, actually, before we go there, I'm, I'm trying to be kind of being frenetic here, but you said something really important. You said something about those who, um, rather than holding out for, uh, you know, the Lord really to say that, to give us that well done, that good, faithful servant, they're looking for, you know, praise of man. I, yeah, I, I, I want to go there for a second, you know what I'm saying? Because I feel like sometimes people, and you know, I keep it 100 on my show, you know what I'm saying? I, I just keep it, you know, yeah. 100, 1,000. Yeah. We have people in the public square who are willing to um, undermine, you know, the efforts of, of people like yourself for the sake of that pat on the back, you know what I mean? Yeah. And even then, when we have consternation about people like that, I think sometimes people feel like, oh, we just, you know, they're coons and, you know, we hate them, blah, 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 blah. And the reality is, no, we're really saying that we're we're making some gospel efforts here, right? Exactly. And we want to hear that well done. And we have people who are undermining that for for lesser reasons. Like, do you want to talk about that for a second? Or you? Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, yeah. Paul says in Galatians, you know, he said, if I was still trying to please man, I wouldn't be a servant for Christ. And yeah. so we we have to recognize that as we engage this, you know, Paul, most of Paul's critique and stress, like he even says it the anxiety of the churches. Most of his yeah. stress was was in-house. And so we have a lot of internal fighting because you can fit a lot of people in the echo chamber. And so when you can, if you can fit a whole bunch of people in the echo chamber saying, you know, critical race theorists, Marxism, social justice warrior, and just because you use the term pejoratively, that doesn't remove the veracity or credence of what we're saying. And what we're saying is we have proof that people are walking away from the faith because of whitewashing. We're on the block talking to people. We're in the barbershops having these conversations. And we're not saying, that, again, the answer isn't blackwashing or any, any race. The answer is the gospel. But That's the right. same way Paul at the Areopagus, he engages there. He engages their questions. Like here's, here's the big thing I say, man. We're telling people, we're telling the world that there is one way, one book for 7 billion people. Yeah. We better be able to defend it. We should yeah. be able to engage people's concerns. And so now not everyone's concern is whitewashing. There are other concerns. Sure, but sure, my sure. point is the, the same way you have apologists uh, on the West Coast always engage in Mormonism. What is he doing? He's engaging a, some issues that are keeping them from understanding the gospel. Right. We're saying, hey, the, the way the Bible has been whitewashed in terms of the presentation, the imagery, the, the revisionist history, this is causing people to think that Christ is not for them or that Christianity is not in a, a religion or faith indigenous to people of African descent. And right. so 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 what we want to do is say, hey, I want to give legitimacy to your concerns. Yes, when you look at the imagery, you just do a Google search. You look at St. Vladimir's Press, you're going to see, you're going to be flooded with white imagery of African and Middle Eastern people. That's a <laughs> misrepresentation. That's right, wrong. Right. That's incorrect. Right. Right. That's, that's, that's idolizing race, uh, whether, you, whether you admit it or not, just to paint, to use one race to represent everybody. So mm. I want to say, I want to give credence and legitimacy to your concerns, but then I want to disagree with your conclusion. Because the conclusion you're coming to is to reject Yeshua. And I'm yeah. saying we cannot hold Yeshua accountable for his followers because Come his on, followers man. failed miserably. And it's recorded in the Bible. Like it's recorded. Yeah, in myself the, included. The, the right. failure. Yeah, of course. We, you know, that's why sure. Paul said, look, I'm, I'm the chief of sinners. Like I, I'm the worst. I'm, I'm the worst dude. one right, in this right, mug. Right, yeah. and he, right. Like, I'm, the I'm the worst one in this mug. <laughs> right. uh, but he's, he's a recipient of grace. And so that, that's what we just got to get back to, man. Uh, oh, in terms man. of the. Uh, in terms of defining it, man, so I say whitewashing it, whitewash Christianity refers to the affinity of white Christian, uh, white Christian scholars to flood the Bible, literature, art and history with white imagery at the expense of authentic ethnicity and truth. That's mm -hmm. what that's what whitewash. That's what whitewashing is. And mm -hmm. so when we're flooded with monocultural images, when we're flooded with cultural imperialism of saying that things that are more European are the only way to do certain things, mm. that is whitewashing. When we're taking African people and giving them European images, 
uh, imagery that is whitewashing when we're not yeah. referencing or honoring Africans and Africa's contribution that is whitewashing and I'm saying that that should not that should not be the testimony or that should not be something that occurs within our faith because that's not representing us well and so when right. I say us, I'm still saying my white brothers and sisters are my brothers and sisters, even if of they course. disagree, even the ones who mischaracterize me, because I'm not <laughs> going to respond the way they do, because right. I want to I want to live out that Philippians four. I want to live out that posture that that exudes the attitude of Christ. I want to apply Galatians five. I want to I want to exude the fruit of the spirit, one being self-control to not respond in my flesh, even when I'm mischaracterized by people who want to label me something that does not fit my position or my ideology or my theology or my sociology. And right. so, uh, but, but yeah, that, that's what whitewashing is. And it is a problem. And it, here's the big thing, Adam, it contributes to lostness. Yeah. And if, yeah. if, if you are a Christian, you should care about lostness because part of our mission is to depopulate hell through the propagation of the gospel. Amen. 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 Yeah, that, that's the central piece, man. And then, too, I, I think that um, it, what do you think about this? So on the one hand, I, I 100 percent agree with you that it contributes to lostness. I would also say, too, that as a matter of discipleship. Right. Yeah. Um, God has called us to a, a deep and abiding fellowship mm -hmm. that is grounded in the cross. Right. Absolutely. And any form of deception that would disrupt that. We are we ought to fight it tooth and nail, right? Mm -hmm. Like we, we ought to, you know, combat it with everything that we have. And when you think about it, you know, if if it is the case, which it is, you know, historically speaking, here in the Western world, that imagery of like you know, white Jesus and um those sorts of things have been used as as forms of oppression. Absolutely. Then you know, th this is not just a matter of culture. This is not just a matter of like politics. You know, I was talking, I was on somebody's show the other day how we need to be careful about politicizing things that are essentially moral and biblical issues primarily. Yes, yes sir. You know, we've got a real problem where the, the, the fellowship that brothers and sisters in Christ ought to be enjoying has been undermined by this issue of race, uh, you know, uh, expressions of white supremacy and so forth in the church, you know, yes. and I know you go into this in your book. I, one thing I, um, quite frankly, I just kind of lost sight of it. I come across it in my studies, but I, I kind of forgotten about is how missionaries would do things like, you know, uh, have people take on so-called uh, Christian names, you know, which were really, you know, uh, uh, European names and things like that. I mean, you, you go into those kind of things, you know, what do we need to do now? Like, you know, where, where are we now? In this? How do we, you know, write the ship, so to speak? Yeah. I mean, obviously it's, it's really applying the gospel in these, in these specific areas yeah. and so when we if, if we're saying that the gospel is the answer and it is sure then what 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 does that compel us to do well in first timothy it tells it compel on titus what it compels us to do good works um not that our works save us james right but yeah, yeah. we're compelled based on the received mercies of god romans 12 to do good works Right. Yeah. And so that, that work will lead us to evangelize, to, to serve, to address these concerns, to put out resources. Right. That that's what it would lead us to do. But it would also lead us to be able to disagree without being disrespectful, mm. uh, to disagree without disengaging mm -hmm. and to actually hear the point of the other person as opposed to, you know, and I'm amazed at how many people have judged either my book, Dr. Mason's book, but haven't read it. Like, like it's, 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 it's just, right, right. you know, it's like, I, I haven't read it, but I know what it is. You, you know, like so they're literally judging a book by literally judging a book by its cover and doing reviews without reading it. It's, right. it's like, 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 well, what, 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 how, how? Right. How? And so, and how so it's just, it's just, an, it's just important for us to say, let, if we can engage, you know, and one of the things I did was put um, questions, uh, discussion questions at the end of each chapter for the purpose of hopefully dissent groups where people disagree. But if we're saying the gospel is that powerful, if for those that say just get to the gospel, well, what does it look like for you to actually engage people you disagree with? Yeah. What, is it, what does it look like for you to be open to maybe there's a blind spot you have and that we may have? I, I'm saying this goes on both ends, right? Um, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Got, and, and, and yeah, there are, we've said, look, there are holes in critical race theory. Like we can't embrace that thing wholesale if there's Absolutely. no redemption in it. But we need to also be equally as aggressive about Christian nationalism. 
Mm. We need to we we, mm -hmm. we need to be equally as aggressive by stating the point that conservatism is not Christianity. Yeah, the first yeah. thing the, the the first thing on their bylaws is we believe in American exceptionalism. God isn't mentioned first. When you look up the the conservative values, the first thing is American exceptionalism. Come well, on, last man. time I checked, last time I checked, if you were reformed, I thought you believe in total depravity. There's nothing exceptional about us. We're sinners in need of grace. Our God is exceptional. He's exceptional. Mm -hmm. He's holy. He's perfect. He's righteous. Mm -hmm. He's the mm -hmm. Romans 326. He's the just and the justifier. He's the one who's exceptional. Ah, uh, but and now so, listen to what you said yeah. though. Now that's that's interesting because when, when you think about this concept of American exceptionalism, what they're really saying is like in comparison, like relative to other nations, other you know, nations currently yeah. and mm -hmm. you know, throughout time, America is built upon principles and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. That puts us in a in a different upper echelon. But what you say was interesting is that, that he's the one who's just, right? Yeah. Yes. So when we're talking, when we're trying, when when you're gonna look for a measuring stick of of merit, if you will, the the idea is not to look to these other nations. The question yeah. is, what is what does God's moral law specify? If you're gonna be exceptional, then be exceptional in regard to that. I'm saying I was talking exactly. to a homeboy man. I was I was talking to a guy. Uh, we talk, you know, we just having the, the whole LeBron James conversation. I don't even know how we came around to this idea of American exceptionalism, but I was saying, you know, when when Michael Jordan was trying to etch out his legacy, <laughs> he didn't compare himself to John Paxson or Steve Kerr. He wasn't looking down at the last guy on the bench, right? right. He's thinking right. like, okay, Magic, Bird, uh, you know, uh, Dominique was was his rival at one point. Uh, Isaiah Thomas. He's looking at the greats. And say, okay, well, if I'm going to measure myself, I need to measure myself in relation to the Jewish Irvings and Kareems of the world, Magic's of the world, not, you know, Bill Cartwright. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I think that's what people are doing with this American section. It's like, dog, you're basing that on, on Bill Cartwright, brother. I'm saying, but you're not, you know, using the right measuring stick, the biblical measuring stick of what is righteous. I'm saying, what does God say justice is? What does justice look like according to him? And if you miss that mark, then any claims of American exceptionalism or any sort of exceptionalism, I think, see, just, you know, lose esteem. And here's the thing, man, and I talk about it, is it is the deification of patriotism. Mm. The goal, the goal becomes the goal becomes your American rights. Where yeah. last time I read First Corinthians eight, Paul was willing to become a temporary vegan if it caused somebody to stumble. That's what yeah. I read. I mean, that's what the text says. That's that's it what says, the text if, says. That's if what it says. offends my brother. Right. Then I won't. That last time I checked, but now because we're deifying patriotism or making patriotism a fifth gospel, Whew. you you have people focusing more on that. That's another and, book, bro. The that's, fifth gospel. That's, that's yeah, another I mean, book. Just, just just that, and and so and that's what happens with when when you converge conservatism and Christianity as if they're synonymous, and I'm saying they are not the same things. Now, it doesn't right. mean that I don't appreciate, it doesn't mean that there aren't, there aren't values that I agree with, like obviously sure, yeah, the, sanctity, yeah. the sanctity of life, right? In the Absolutely. womb, we, we would agree. As a matter of fact, you got ball, you got a song about it, I mean, you got a rap about that, you know what I mean? So yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. like like these these things matter, but it's like, we, we, we have to also address that secular conservatism um, uh, the yeah. the idolatry of of these conservative values and merging that as if that is the in all be all of Christianity because when you deify it you begin to miss the value of people and so now that's why you so if we talk about police brutality again it's CRT last time I checked value starts at creation not salvation. Mm. Value the Come on, bro. day value starts at Come creation, on, and so everyone, even those that disagree with us, are worthy of dignity, honor, and respect because they're made in His image. Right. And so right. when when this whitewashing happens and there's a deification of patriotism, you hear more conservative talking points than you do scripture. And, and we and we and we have to we got to address that. So if I just wish we could see that same energy. Uh, that's that's been given a CRT to these issues that we're seeing as well, bro. I'm I'm like man, <laughs> I'm I'm getting off track because because I feel like these these are all important points that I don't want to miss. It. I'm yeah. going to definitely get back to the book, but you know what you said is so important, man. What mm -hmm. you said was so important. The reality is, you got cats who wasn't saying anything about race, racism, or justice or anything until this whole CRT issue blew up. And I'm mm -hmm. like, fam, if you wasn't saying anything before. 
if all these you know different shootings and if, if Botham Jean happened, you didn't say nothing, and Trayvon Martin happened, you didn't say nothing. But all of a sudden, CRT is like the the Darth Vader of all you know sins and ideologies. You know what I'm saying? It's like, come on, fam. You know where where were you at before? And and the reality is, I, I honestly, I think I I would invite people who don't understand where we're coming from to just go to the hood, man. You know what I'm saying like, look, look at what people are actually talking about. You know, because what happens is, you know, when you and I, we defend the gospel every day, all day, right? And then what happens is, you know, we're constantly confronted with this idea of Christianity is a white man's religion, so on and so forth. And then let's keep it real, you know, Pastor so and so, whether it be a Jeff Durbin or whether it be, you know, I'll just be explicit, whether it be a James White or whatever, says something extremely reckless, you know, and uninformed from a, a racial standpoint. People literally, I'm thinking about. I've had people specifically DM me. I'm talking about Hebrew Israelites, Comedic Silver, DM me. But like, yeah, this is what we're talking about. You know, these are the guys that, that we're talking about. And so now I'm in a position where I'm like, well, look, everybody's not like that. You know, this is not what all the Christian brothers are like. But it puts us in this weird position to where we're having to fight now on different fronts. This is a reality, whether people like it or not. You know what I'm saying? This is the reality, and we have to deal with these kind of things, man. You know, so salute to you. You know, for for being on the front lines of that, man. But um, you know, definitely, you know, definitely getting back to the book. I know I got all, off topic there, but you know, we just brothers talking, so this this kind of goes that route. But um, you know, I'm thinking about experience that I had uh, years ago, which I think touches on that last point that you made. I was at a, a, a Coptic church. You know, I just visited you know one Sunday just to kind of see what it was like, and I remember seeing this the different pictures they had of like you know Moses the Black and and Athanasius and um, you know just various you know Augustine you know it, who looked like me, you know what I'm saying? It was the first time I'd been to a church and seen something like that really pronounced like in, in the foyer as soon as you walk in. And it did do something for me. It, you know, it, it was something that was, that kind of hit me in a way that I didn't expect, you know, but then the, the converse of that, and then you get into this in your book when it comes to like, you know, white Jesus, obviously, you know, I mean, that's, that's such a predominant figure. And I mean, just across the Western world in the churches, you know, talk about, white Jesus for a second and just the impact of white Jesus and kind of give us a snippet a little bit in terms of what you, you know, you, your research yeah. and, and how that's had an impact. Yeah. So one of the things, man, I, I, uh, I, I, I reference a breakfast club interview that Dr. Umar Johnson was did. And, and he says that white Jesus picture is the greatest weapon of mass destruction in the black community. Mm. And this this particular broadcast has, I think, by now over three million views. And most of it is affirming Dr. Umar's sentiments. And what 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 he's saying is, all right, th because this image which you use this way and in, in the book, I call him Pantene Pro V Jesus. <laughs> you know, he got the hair and, the, and the, you know, that Pantene Pro V white Jesus. The, the maybe you know, it's Maybelline Jesus. Yeah, right? he got, yeah, you got, he, 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 you know, the Maybelline Messiah, right? <laughs> so, you know, they got, you know, that, right, right, that's, right. that's how they have them, right? This uh, Europeanized. And, and when you, when you begin to dig in it, um, you know, uh, you, you, you see how missionaries use white Jesus. They only would use white Jesus in their gospel tracks. They, they specifically used that imagery because they wanted to associate Christianity with whiteness. And again, this is not painting all white people this way. I mean, I have sure, the sure. references. The references are in my book as to what they did and how mm -hmm. they they wanted to use, wanted, wanted to associate Christianity with whiteness and purity and, and black and brown as negative and sinful. Mm -hmm. And so they they white Jesus was a part of that that eisegetical, eisegetical view of scripture, but all this also that degra uh, the degradation of black and brown people. And so I kind of chronicle that. And then as a section where I say, where did white Jesus come from? And we just kind of mm -hmm. walk through the images, the images we have um, that, how do we get to this image today? And so what, what we're really looking at is Eurocentrism. So mm -hmm, often, mm -hmm. oftentimes, you know, we talk about, Afrocentrism and black people yeah. are told that, they, that they need to submit their blackness to the gospel. Amen. I agree. But white people need to do the same thing. And so your Eurocentrism is more prevalent in America. And that needs mm -hmm. as much attention and it needs to be called out for the idolatry that it is. And so yeah. part of Eurocentrism was a white Jesus. And so I, I kind of go back to I deal with Romanitas and Tacitus and his and his writing mm -hmm. of Germania, where there that's where you begin to see this idea of Anglo and 
and superiority being from Anglo uh, Anglo people and their blood. Mm. And, and again, the references are there wow. for people to be able to see the chronic to chronicle the historical um, narrative, false narrative that, yeah, that got yeah. us to this point. And now this false narrative is causing people to turn to false faiths. We call them bricks, black religious identity cults. Yeah, because yeah. because of the, the 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 flood the flooding of white imagery that we're presented with. Got you, got you. Interesting. Let me ask you this. So, I mean, you know, you have a ridiculous amount of citations. We were just we were talking about this before you uh, you hopped on. You know what I'm saying? And and I say that I, you know purpose because I think that it's important that people need to understand this is not just a uh, um, an opinion piece. <laughs> okay, you know, this is something that's well researched and you're chronicling real history. Okay. Um, you know, with that being said, you know, as, as you were kind of, you know, investigating the sources, you know, gaining new information, was there anything that kind of shocked you? Anything that took you by surprise? Like, man, I, you know, I didn't know that, you know, and anything that just kind of like really, you know, take you back, take you back like that. Yeah. I mean, I think that, well, well you kind of knew, but the, when you look at, so I, I include the cornerstone speech and then you just see the, 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 the idolatry of the Confederacy. And oh, yeah, yeah. When, you, when you start looking at them in relation to white Jesus, you, you, you know, you, you become like, like, wow. And, and here, here is they convince themselves of this false view of scripture in order to justify owning people um, because they didn't see them as people. They saw them as property. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so when you start looking at that and you start reading what these people said, it's like, this is not a heritage to celebrate. This is this yeah. is not a heritage to celebrate when right. you actually read how they saw people. And so uh, so mm. that 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 was that was part of it. But then um, I referenced, you know, Lena Waith, the author of uh, I mean, the director and creator of Queen and Slim and oh, how why, why she made why she made Slim, uh, you know, why, why she made him a Christian and how she said, well, you know, it's just something we believe, even though this is part of our our oppression and so mm. and then i reference killer mike same thing i reference yeah. chris rock right. and, and you just see so many influential black and brown people literally associate christianity with oppression and so right. um right. um when, when, on the 29th when i got a uh, i got a hot video made the promo video will kind of address that but yeah man so that those are yeah. some of the things like man just just seeing how bad it is i can't say it shocked me but it just i was more disheartened on one end but even more motivated to get this resource out and to find an additional source so like yeah yeah yeah, yeah. i just said you know what let me let me just give give y'all as many receipts as i can I, and i right. probably still could have gave you more but it's like look I, right. I can't make the book 500 pages oh man you know? nah, but let, mean, me, <laughs> let me you you let, gave let, everything yeah. you had bro like you, you gave you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. not a little, like a little yeah. you know dinky book here man it's not like a little pamphlet or something like that you know but yeah but i, I think what you said is so important i honestly believe Many people. I mean, I think in our context, if you're engaged in this kind of stuff, doing real evangelism, then you see it. But, yeah. you know, I think people just really don't understand how serious this is. You know what I'm saying? I think they really don't understand how you have some of the thought leaders in our community perpetuating this idea, which kind of heaps on even more, yeah. you know, to, to the myth of, of white Jesus and, and the, the whitewashing of Christianity, man, yeah. you know, which I think is, is, is uh, you know, very unfortunate. I know when I first started uh, you know, getting into urban apologetics, one thing that really shocked me was the ability of the enslaved person to differentiate between Christianity right. proper yeah. and, you know, the white man's religion, if you will. You know what I'm saying? Because you really do. I mean, the more and more you study, you really do see that slave masters were pushing a, a caricature of what Christianity really was in, in at least many instances. But so many times African enslaved persons were able to tease out what was real in the scriptures I mean, and you really do see that in their own words you know oh you yeah. were say something about that or you now yeah yeah because uh, and i'm glad you mentioned that adam because it's important for for the believers watching this we we have to get out the right narrative slave masters did not attempt to beat christianity into their black and brown slaves they did not again they did not attempt to beat in christianity they attempted to beat in inferiority there's a difference mm. 
they attempted to teach them that their identity and their value and their their very being was tainted. Yeah. They, they tried yeah. to use the scripture to do that. But this is why they had a slave Bible. This is why they did not. I was about to go there. Yeah. They, it was mm -hmm. no way for them to. They knew if they would have read Exodus that that God comes in and addresses oppression. Yeah. Right. And so that he 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 he's a God of the oppressed. That's exactly right. But 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 the other side, the balance is this. He extends grace to the oppressor, Jonah. This mm -hmm. is why Jonah gets upset. Right. Like, man, I knew you was merciful. <laughs> right. And then, you know, Bro. And so 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 this man. is the balance to where we got to say, no, he's a God of the oppressed. Yeah. But the, but the oppressor has an opportunity to repent. And so what I get at is. My quote is reconciliation is impossible without confrontation. Mm, Jesus, on, Jesus, Jesus confronts our sin on the cross. And when we when we when we're trusting him, we have to acknowledge what the wrongdoing, the wrongdoing must be confronted. Yeah. And so when we talk about this, when people want to say, just get to the gospel, well, the gospel confronts the wrong. That's, That's the right. point. That's and right. so how how are we talking about reconciliation when we want to whitewash what happened mm -hmm. or whitewash what's currently happening? Like, that's mm -hmm. not biblical. It's not like it's not. reconciliation is impossible without confrontation. It was confronted. Colossians. Now, it's, it's been dealt away with. It's been done away with his his finished work. We, what we do don't save us. Mm -hmm. But again, mm -hmm. we're because we're saved, we do good works. And so when we talk about reconciling with our brother, which Christ has sealed for us. Re it's not that reconciliation means we ignore what happened. Right, we don't hold right. it over each other's head. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Amen. But we, Amen. but we don't, we don't deny truth either. And Absolutely. so, what we have to, what, what, uh, what my evangelical brothers, I need to stop hearing so much Ben Shapiro. Facts don't care about <laughs> your feelings, and I need, I need, I need to hear more. First Corinthians thirteen. I need to Bro. hear more. Uh, mourn with those who mourn. We, you know, weep with those who weep. Right. I, I need to hear more scripture. Come on, man. Than conservative talking points because that it's that word of God. That's what's sharpened in any two edged sword. Not conservative Amen. talk and not liberal talk. Because I'm not a Democrat either. So, Amen. Because so I know somebody will try to do that. Like, no, I'm not. I'm yeah. not saying that. Right. I'm right. not saying Biden has the answer. He don't. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm with you. Know, you. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. So it's, it's yeah, just yeah. important that we understand that. But no, I mean, you're so right, man. But it was, it's funny to me, though. <laughs> so obviously I, I get emails, you know, messages, whatever. People hit me up, like, oh, man, I see, you know, you you know, you got this, this book with Eric Mason, man. I don't know, man. You know, you know, that's CRT. I mean, you get offended if he says something, this or that, and the third. But for like the last four years, these same people have been telling me to, to you know, forget about political correctness. Right. Don't, you know, fact, you know, facts don't care about your feelings. You know what I mean? All this kind of stuff. I've been hearing that for four years. Now all of a sudden, <laughs> y'all care about feelings and, and all this. It's like, what? Like, where is this coming from? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's just such an unequal scale, man. It's it's hilarious to me. But you know what you said is so important, and I definitely want to go back to it. Let, let me let me ask you what you think about this. So when it comes to, and I'll be explicit, whether it be American history, uh, and just the, the ugly parts of that, whether it be you know the church history, you know some of the stuff you described about the, you know the 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 uh, the missionaries and some of the things they would do the the slave Bible so on and so forth, I think that what we often see among like the, you know the, the super patriotic types is rather than approaching these things from a biblical perspective, seeing the depravity of man and then also seeing you know where the imago day shines through in some instances things like that rather than doing that, you, we actually I think we would see what happened in, in Genesis three you know um, with the fall of man because Adam and Eve you know I'm saying when they fell. What, what do they go do? They go, they made coverings for themselves, right? Yeah. I'm saying they made coverings for themselves mm -hmm. um, to hide their shame, right? But then when God comes along, confronts them, you know what I'm saying? You know, they, he calls them out, calls out the servants, so forth. What did he do? He went removed. and made skins for them. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm saying he removed, he said, basically, those tunics, whatever those coverings were for themselves, were insufficient, mm -hmm. right? You don't have a covering for your own sin. I'm saying man is incapable of providing an appropriate covering for his sin. God had to make coverings for them. Ultimately, we saw, we find that expressed through Christ. I'm saying unless you're covered by the blood of Jesus, then whatever sin that you, you're grappling with remains, right? But rather than trying to cover up their sin, let's be explicit here. Rather than in the face of you know America's you know, you know, racist aspects of their history, saying, Oh, well, yeah, but we showed up for World War II. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah, but you know, what but you know. 
uh, we had the Civil War. We got past that. And it was like America, you know, like, that was just the end of racism. You know what I'm saying? Oh, but we had the Civil Rights Act of 64. Yeah, that's all good. Right. But those things shouldn't be leveraged as coverings for the uglier parts, some of which still have expressions today. You know Unless you're going to come with the gospel and the right covering, then we're going to continue to have the, these these faulty coverings, man. Like, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, man. So, so I got several thoughts. Um, oh, okay. All right, let yeah. it go. So, let it roll. Yeah, so, 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 so one, you talked about the covering, right? Mm -hmm. And we 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 talked about American exceptionalism and patriotism being deified to the point of it being a fifth gospel. So, the result of that is the shield of faith is now replaced by the American flag. Whew. So, 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 so now we're I'm covering myself with my American identity. Right. And not no 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 what we've been given. Say here's the point. Like Paul says in Philippians three twenty that our citizenship is in heaven. Therefore, we are kingdom citizens. That's right. So my covering is the shield of faith, not the American flag. That doesn't mean I, I appreciate the my country based on Acts Absolutely. sixteen. God God allowed Absolutely. me to be born here. I'm praise God for it. But Absolutely. that's not my my primary citizenship. All of us have dual citizenship, like Paul had in Romans sixteen. Right. 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 Um, but my dual citizenship is heaven and earth. But right. my primary, my primary one is heaven. And so I want to bring a kingdom perspective there. Therefore, for me, like I said earlier, dignity doesn't start at salvation. It starts at creation. That's right. So That's that right. means that means when an unarmed person is shot and killed. I care about that. The mm -hmm. same way I do about a, a baby yeah. in the womb, right? That's right. Because That's right. A, a biblical life ethic not only cares about the life in the womb, it cares about the life outside the womb. Right. And so if, if we're really saying, if they're saying get to the gospel, then that means we're bringing a kingdom perspective here. And so we don't turn a blind eye to these issues. Like right. you can't, clearly you can't legislate the heart. We're getting ready to celebrate Juneteenth. Yeah. Abraham Lincoln signed something in 1863, but that did not change the hearts of how they saw black and brown people. We celebrate Juneteenth two years later, 1865, people in Galveston, Texas, um, now receiving their freedom. But why do we still need a civil rights act in the 1960s? Because on, you, can't, you can't legislate the heart. Therefore, when certain evangelicals say police brutality isn't a thing, well, now you're undermining your, your own theology because you don't believe in total depravity then. Last time right. I checked, it's not total depravity. It's not partial depravity. It's total depravity. Come if on, it's man. total, then that can that can play out in the form of a of of a a armed police officer in a blue suit pointing a black gun uh, at a brown man. man. And any any abuse of power because of depravity, because of sin, should be shunned, regardless of the color of the officer. Like I, I think that the the false narrative is that we only care when the officer is white. Now I don't care. I don't care what color the officer is. I agree, if, absolutely. Any, Amen. Any abuse of power Amen. should yes. be shunned. And and again, give you some Bible. Act sixteen, mm -hmm. when Paul was a victim of magistrate brutality, and they Come tried on, to release him. What did he say? He said, Nah. Yeah. Now you find that I got dual citizenship. Y'all want to act brand new. Y'all want to try to release <laughs> right. me silently. Nope. Right. Right. He said, You you beat me publicly. Now he protested, not not in the form of a march, but protested verbally by saying, no, you you violated my being. That's you right. violated me. And Paul addressed it. That's and right. what's funny, why was he beat? The gospel, because the slave girl master saw they could no longer make money because her social and spiritual status changed. Come on, man. And as a result of that, they couldn't make money off her anymore. And so because now they could no longer monetize a human being, they end up beating Paul. That's crazy. And so it's, it's just interesting the hermeneutical gymnastics people play to, to say we should not talk about these things as if somehow that's an affront or a deviation from the gospel. But mm. then most of the time there are many. And I want to I say I, I want to say some I want to use it. Be intentional about saying some or many that's right. and not all, because even though a lot of right. broad stroke us, we're refusing to repay evil for evil. We're, we're, we're not we're not going to broad stroke them. That's and right. So that's right. That's that's what I'm getting at is like saying that the heart of this, like this will never replace the Bible. It, it, it never will. It never should. Amen. But yeah. I have tons of scripture in it. Um, 
because that's the lens through which I'm approaching these these topics. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad you said that, you know, that we, we don't want to generalize and broad brush everybody, you know, and even coming back to, you know, you, you define, you know, whitewashing earlier, talking about particularly at the level of, of scholarship. You know, the fact of the matter is, especially when you get to the Ph.D. level, I think a lot of people don't understand that. Um, much of that study is very interest driven, right? Because mm -hmm. if you're going to have, you know, if you're going to dedicate, you know, five or more years of your life to a dissertation, it's probably going to be something that, that you're interested in, right? It's, it's going to be right. something that you really care about, right? right? And the unfortunate fact of the matter is, if what you care about is in some way shaped by your culture, your ethnicity, so on and so forth, then if you're a Caucasian person, you're probably less inclined to care about bringing out the Africanness of Tertullian or Augustine or, you know, the, the kind of things that events Bantu would key in on. Like, that's not going to exactly. be your area of interest. Yeah. And yeah. so therefore, just based upon that alone, you're going to have an uh, underrepresentation when it comes to covering those kind of topics, even though there are resources out there. And, you know, Bantu, as you know, is engaged in a lot of uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Translating of documents that he's not making the documents up. I mean, they're already out there. It's just nobody's taking the time to really translate them. You know, particularly of African uh, Christian texts. Uh, with that being said, there are exceptions. You know, you have a Thomas Odin, who you know would would give himself over to a project like you know, um, you know how Africa is shaped, shaped the Christian you know, mind. The Christian yeah. mind. Uh, shout out to uh, Jerry Walls. I think it's uh, excuse me, it might be Andrew Walls. Is I said Jerry, but it's actually Andrew Walls that I'm thinking about. Uh, who was one of the first scholars I heard. He's a Caucasian guy, one of the first scholars I heard to give a presentation on the African presence uh, in, in Christian history. And that really sparked me off on the path that I'm on now. So again, we don't want to you know, whitewash, you know, saying that, you know, generalize everybody, but nevertheless, you know, you're pointing to uh, you know, a serious issue here. I want to take yeah, time to acknowledge this, um, this, Oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Now I was going to say, you know, cause, cause I think pe people will say like, there's no mass conspiracy. No, it was. And I have the and and we prove it like you can literally see how scholars treat treated the Kushites in their commentaries and their scholarly engagement. And we know this is a black African tribe versus the Asiatic or European ones. And so more attention was given there and they would broad stroke the Kushites as if, as if they were slaves exclusively when that's not the only way that they're described in scripture. And so again, when you're mishandling the word and, and you yeah. have the title of scholar, that's something we should deal with. But here's the thing people need to admit about culture and exegesis and hermeneutics. Matthew mm -hmm. Henry, Matthew Henry's commentary on James. He literally says in his commentary about James two, when they're talking about not giving someone a better seat in the book of James, um, he says, Surely James wasn't talking about pew purchasing. Yes, he was. <laughs> now, exactly why, why, right, right. now, why would why would Matthew Henry say that? Because that was something done in his tradition. He could so he he allowed his cultural experience to impose his commentary, and we're saying that that and wow. it's not just Matthew Henry. And for those who go behind me and read Matthew Henry's commentary on James, the, 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 the older versions, you see how he wants to defend his culture when literally the text is literally talking about don't let somebody buy a better seat. <laughs> like, That's literally like, what saying, like, bro. like don't show favor, but don't show favoritism to the poor either. either. That's right. So, so you, you know, like he's given that balance. And so, like, this is this is the this is the research we got to do and begin to see, like, guys, like yeah. People bring their cultural blind spots and preferences to their interpretation. So you got to be careful just embracing anything, including us, wholesale. Now you you, you, you got to be careful with that. We said anything, including us. And I think that's that's interesting that you put that caveat in there, because I think when people listen to the first part of what you said, that, that people put their own culture, so on and so forth, they what they hear is, OK, what you're really saying is white people do that. <laughs> or something like that, like if you're only directing it at white folks. But again, throughout your work, you're very clear that this is not, you know, I mean, you know, you're not 
uh, using unequal scales here, you're just talking about right practice when it comes to scholarship. That's that's really all we're talking mm-hmm. about here, regardless of you know whose scholarship it is that we're that we're dealing with. You know, mm-hmm. I want to say thank you by the way to everybody that you know uh, the chat is watching, man. It's been, the chat has been live, man. It's, it's been popping. I, yeah, I, see, I, 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 I see. might do a couple. I might do a couple questions, but we'll see about that in a second. But I want to say thank you to everybody who dropped those super chats in. Uh, you know, my kids, particularly my son, who, who's go through 50 diapers a day, certainly appreciate it. So yeah, yeah, yeah definitely, definitely, thank you. You know, but I think you was about to say something, man. So I, I'm sorry, I cut you off. No, again, just back when we talk about the dignity thing, like I think people people think that somehow, um, you know, a criminal doesn't have an image of God. Like when when we talk about these, you know, it, 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 we're not saying that they were innocent. We're not saying George Floyd was a role model. Right. Like 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 stop you stop in stop 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 filling in the blanks. Yeah. Yeah. We said we're we're saying let we're saying these were unarmed people who are image bearers. Doesn't mean they're innocent. But them not being innocent doesn't mean it should be a death sentence either. And yeah. and that's yeah. that's that's what people need to realize. Then we got Walter Scott who was shot in the back seven times, and then a guy dropped the gun by him. Right? right you, you got right. A, you, you got on video some officers video. planting planting stuff on people. And again, this 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 is not this doesn't mean that we don't love the police. They have a difficult job, of course. And so so I I, I did an interview with Whole Brother Mission, and he was asking me specifically about this. And he was like, what's your response to Blue Lives Matter? I said, Blue Lives do matter. Absolutely. Of course. But I said, here's the difference. Here's the difference. Your blue life is your choice. That's a profession. I didn't mm-hmm. choose this. So so real, I agree. Man. I agree with the sentiment Black Lives Matter. I don't agree with the organization. And so when you try to compare and you say Blue Lives, no, Blue Lives was a profession you chose. The same way me as a pastor, I'm under strict judgment. I know the responsibilities I have when I accept this calling. I'm under strict judgment. James 3.1. I have to answer to the souls for the people I pastor. Hebrews 13.17. That cop, you are under more scrutiny. That's what you signed up for. True. So your blue, blue life was a choice. Black, brown, white, European wasn't. God allowed you to be the color or the ethnicity that you are. So we got to stop. You know, you, you, you can't compare a profession to something you were born with. Now yeah, again, but both but both totally. lives matter. Let me be clear. All True. lives in terms of in terms of the standpoint of being made in God's image, they matter. And so what we're saying is that 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 we we shouldn't a death sentence shouldn't be the case especially when you're unarmed. Doesn't mean that they were all the way innocent. Doesn't mean that they were saints. We're not saying that. I I don't hear people marching saying he was a saint. She was a saint. <laughs> right, I don't right, hear right, them right. saying that. That like, right. so so let's just let's 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 be honest about our assessment or our critique. Right, right. Well, I mean, I think I think you raise an important point, man. And and one of the one of the things I think we have to do, and and you alluded to this early that first and foremost we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Is that we've been translated exactly. out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of His dear Son. And I think that when it comes to uh, political issues, mm-hmm. I think so often we allow the secular world to drive the conversation and the church is the caboose. And so rather than bringing with us the full weight of the biblical ethic and the biblical worldview, what we end up doing is we end up short arming you know, the biblical, the biblical worldview and then taking on values and ideas that are from, from out there, out there in the world. And I said it to say, that the scriptures are very, um, they, pre- they present this profound notion of lament. You know what I'm saying? There's this mm-hmm. profound notion of engaging the brokenness of this world in, in a way that's both sorrowful, but then also redemptive. You know what I'm saying? Like there's this, there's this real theology of lament. And I think that what happens is if you allow some people in the conversation to shape it, then it's like, okay, well, you don't, we can't lament over people who were guilty. Or, or resisting, or maybe, maybe because it's a white cop that did wrong, we can't lament over him either. Like, no, as a Christian, as somebody who is, you know, supposed to be seeking after the Imago Christi, right, being conformed to the image of Christ, we have occasion to lament wherever we encounter brokenness, whoever the perpetrator of that brokenness is. And I think that sometimes, if, if you leave that part out, then I think you find yourself um, in a position where you're more easily steered by non-redemptive forces who engage in these conversations. Mm-hmm. And that's something that we really need, I think, to take stock of. Yeah, man, We so we had a shooting in my city. 
yeah. um, a couple of years ago. And it was a white yeah. officer and it was a black man. And so I led I led a time of prayer and the, the news happened to come out and they and they were shocked that we prayed for the cop, too. Mm. They they expected us to only pray for the one who was shot. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, I said, no, I said, we're, we're going to pray for for both. And but but because of the, the because, again, I'm a kingdom citizen, my, my yeah. citizenship is in heaven. So we pray for the cop. Yeah. And we pray for we pray for the one, the man who was shot. And we pray for our city because there were protests that night. There was, it was a lot of things happening in the neighborhood. Yeah. And I said that I said, that's 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 the posture we're going to have. That's the posture we're going to exhibit is we're going to lift up both. But just by confronting when certain things are done and, and we've had people, officers charged now. And so when that happens, addressing that injustice doesn't mean you see all cops that way. And I think that's that's the thing is like, let's stop the, the broad stroking of a perspective just because you are dealing with a particular issue. The last thing I'll say is this, man, is mm -hmm. we, we have to stop trying to the thing. The thing I see is people trying to control our concerns. Like they they, they want to say, well, you say this, but you don't care about lives in the womb. How do you know that? Like, like I, I, I've had people accuse me of that. And I said, yeah. don't you, I, yeah. I've, I've written for CareNet. Um, one of our areas of outreach for my city is unborn. We right. give to these organizations for lives in the womb. Yeah. And so what, what you did is you just judged me. And I've right. had some repent and say, yeah, I, I did judge you because of the color of your skin. I assumed that most blacks are pro-choice. I've had people confess that. Wow. So I'm saying like, that's what we need to recognize that, you know, again, people are broad stroking. But then when you confront them on it, they want to move the finish line. Come <laughs> they on, man. Change, yeah. They want to change. Moving that goalpost, yeah. man. But, you know, yeah. so it kind of bringing it back because actually this is something I wanted to ask you about. You know, we're talking about some of these, I'll just call them like secular, I won't say secular, but I'll just say it's societal issues. I'll put it that way. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and kind of how those conversations go. Do you feel like there's an intersection between those kinds of things and the whitewashing that you're talking about in the church? Like, is it the case that do you, do you think the whitewashing is, is a reflection of a larger problem that and maybe there's an intersection between the two? What, what, what do you think about that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, it, again, it goes back to something we hinted at. But I think you and Alfredo said this when you did your miseducation of Candace Owens um, yeah. piece. And one of the things you guys said and I actually said in the book is not to make a feature who, of who you are, the foundation of who you are. Mm -hmm. And so when any race or ethnicity does that, yeah. then it, and, 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 and you're not led by the Holy Spirit, you're going to look down on others. That's what, that's what James is getting at. What causes yeah. these quarrels among you? It's in you, he says. That's what he what, said. What causes it, it's, it's in you. And so again, there, there are examples. I mean, if you if you look abroad, you'll see Chinese Jesus, African Jesus. You know what I'm saying? So, right. But, right. but I, I'm dealing with something. So, like me dealing with something specific doesn't mean I don't recognize that there are other 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 aspects of this. Sure. I'm dealing with something, and it's just unreasonable to think that I'm going to address every single issue in one book. And that's one of the things I see is like when mm. that when we when you address whitewashing that they act like you don't recognize that there are other issues. No, I'm dealing with a specific one. Like I have not read one book written by a person that addresses every issue. It's impossible. And so, but yeah, and it's so I'm, I'm, yeah I'm, I'm dealing with a specific issue. That doesn't mean I think that I, that I don't recognize other issues. This book is addressing this specific issue and how yeah. it contributes to lostness. Are there other issues? Are there other factors? Absolutely. But no one addresses everything. But it seems like when people want to put this on me, on uh, the urban apologist that, that cares about all lostness, but specifically dealing with black and brown lostness. Now, all of a sudden, I got to be an expert on everything. Like, no, <laughs> right, I, no, right, no, right, right. I'm addressing this issue right. so that they're not being intellectually honest. They're being unreasonable in that sense when it's like, well, you should have like, no, I'm, I'm dealing with this specific issue. And so we're dealing with whitewashing. That's what we're dealing with. In right. this book, that's right. all. 
Well, and, and I think that you're absolutely right. I mean, we had to be careful that, um, again, I, I think I've used the phrase a couple of times, but we, that we're using equal scales because you have some apologists who 99% of what they talk about is historical evidence for the resurrection. Or you might mm -hmm. have another apologist. Uh, Gary Habermas. Like, Gary Habermas. Yeah. When you think, yeah, when yeah. You hear, see, you, exactly. So when you hear Habermas, you think, oh, resurrection. You know, Michael yeah. Tona, oh, resurrection. You know what I'm saying? When I think about, uh, you know, uh, Dr. William Lane Craig, I think about like the Kalam cosmological argument. You know, there are certain people who specialize in certain things because they've identified a need to address it. And that's where they've done their, their studies, so on and so forth. Well, likewise, when it comes to this issue right here, you know, there are just scores of people who are being impacted by the lie that uh, Christianity it's a white is a white man's, man's religion. Yeah. And so therefore we have to have somebody who's got to be willing to, to dig in with some scholarship, I'm saying, you know, right reasoning, and ultimately, first and foremost, scripture and the gospel to tackle those kind of things, right? right. So so we have specialists of all kinds, and that's the beauty of the body. You know what I'm saying? We can't, we don't all have to be generalists hey. tackling the same things. Hey man, yeah. one, one one thing, and I, I don't know if you're gonna do questions, but you yeah, I, you I know, wanted, if, if you're cool with it, we can take about yeah, three or yeah, four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's cool. I, I'll go back to the like the police brutality, that that thing. One of the things I do say in the book too is you know, because I get hit with this too, you get hit with this. Well, what about black on black crime? Mm -hmm. And I say, and, and he, here's my retort a lot of times. Now, and again, this is not the same for all people, but I'm specifically the people who will send me uh Thomas Soul and They'll oh, quote man, Fox man. News. And I'll say this. I'll say, listen, the, the black church has been doing things about gun violence for decades. Decades, bro. They don't call it the black on black crime rally. It's called the stop the violence rally. Come it's on, called man. it's called hope for the block. Right. And not all the time. You, this may shock you, but Fox News don't necessarily come up when they're doing that. So oh, just because I, you don't just absolutely. because you don't see it on Fox News or yeah, any yeah. other MSNBC, so so I can be fair, the liberal ones too, doesn't mean that it's not being done. It doesn't mean right. what just because we talk about police brutality, it doesn't mean that we're negating black responsibility. Um, and, and, and you know, so so just just like, like again, like you know, we got to stop the, the the broad stroking and and the assumptions, and that's why I wanted to be attention about using the word some. Like I'm not I'm not saying all white scholars did this. I am right, addressing right, right. specific ones. When I talk about self hatred, I'm not saying that you know I don't mention anybody as a coon. I, 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 you know, I, 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 it's an acrostic. I, I want to show you like self hatred is a sin because yeah. it's it's an yeah. affront to the amago day, right? right? So so we we want to always come back to responsibility. Yeah. Um, but again, that responsibility go both ways. So we're talking about the responsibility on the cop as well or whoever. And right, so that's right. that's just I just wanted to kind of get that in there. Well, no, matter of um, fact, maybe we can do um, before we end out, you know, let's let's take maybe like three or four questions. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, I, I want to come back on something that you said. But uh, before I do that, uh, if the mods can help me out, let's go ahead and get some questions in here. I'll take super chats first. If the moderators can help me to you know keep track of those, that'd be great. And either, you know, a tag them or repost them or something like that so I can identify them and shoot straight to them. Uh, but I want to come back to something that you said, because when people you're right. You know, when we bring up, um, uh, I'll just call it police misconduct, you know, whether it be of the most heinous sort of somebody, you know, being uh, unjustifiably killed or, you know, other forms of harassment. When we bring those things up, it is common for people to say things like, well, you know, what about abortion or what about black on black crime? And there's just so many different things we can say about it. I, mean, I really need to do a whole nother show. But to keep it simple, first of all, that retort is fallacious. It's, it's this actual fallacy that we can refer to called the fallacy of relative privation, right? The fallacy of relative privation is where you say somebody cites a, a problem or issue and you point to there being some greater uh, problem or issue as a means of, of, of re rebutting the person. Say that again. Person. Say that one more time. Yeah. It's called what? The fallacy of relative privation. The, the fallacy of relative privation. Relative so. privation, right. You know what I'm saying? And so it's basically, it, it's really, that's a textbook you know, example. When people say, what about black on black crime? It's okay, if I voice an issue and you point to some greater problem or issue, or at least what you believe to be a greater problem or issue, as a means of, of you know, uh, a rebuttal to my, you know, what I'm bringing to the table, that's the fallacy of relative privation. Because the reality is, even if it is the case that there is some greater problem, that doesn't negate the fact that the problem that I'm bringing to the table is indeed an issue, 
right? So it's, it's it, you can't debunk somebody, you know, um, you know, bringing forth the problem by deciding, you know, what you believe to be a greater problem. Now, the reality is what the Bible says is we need to eschew evil. It doesn't say eschew the greatest evil. It doesn't, you right. know, mean to eschew whatever evil you believe to be most present in society. We need to eschew evil. We need to hate evil. So, you know, I'm going to put it in the words of, um, uh, you know, uh, Dr. MLK. You know, he talked about how injustice anywhere is a threat to justice, justice everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You know, the fact of the matter is, you know, we can't, you can't give an inch to injustice, particularly if a particular type of injustice has had a stronghold in the society because there's that much greater potential for that stronghold to, you know, come back, you know, e even stronger. You have to, you have to, you know, hold up a standard against any form of injustice, you know, um, in, in light of what, could potentially, you know, be even, even far worse. You can't let it get bad and then start, then start addressing it <laughs> and, and put it differently. Uh, the other side of it is too, you know, all communities, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, whatever, all communities uh, tend to have higher rates of offense toward one another. I mean, you, you violate, criminally speaking, you violate those with whom you're in proximity to. That's, if you look at statistics, I'm saying that, that bears itself out um, in, in any context. You're far more, if you're a white person, you're far more likely to be victimized by another white person than somebody else, black or, or whatever. Statistically, that's the truth. I think it's like 84% uh, when it comes to you know white on white crime. I think it's like I think it's like 83, 84%, like, but it's a pretty large number. So again, we have to be careful about um just going with narratives and and you know stuff that is just kind of parroting what people say in society and stuff like that. You know, we need to first of all, we should be critical thinkers. We should be first and foremost biblical thinkers, um, and we need to approach things from a from a biblical vantage point. Um, so, if you want to say something about that, I'm gonna look for some some questions, and I'm gonna uh, we'll, we'll go from there. No, I think you hit it uh, with. I hadn't heard that phrase. So I, you just taught me a phrase: the the fallacy of relative privation. That's what it's called. Yeah, fallacy of relative privation. Exactly. Yeah, just yeah. just when you 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 just bring up another issue, basically to discount. The veracity of the particular issue that you're addressing so that's i'm glad it. to kind of i'm glad to have a label a label for it and, that, <laughs> yeah, that, and that's that's one of the things one of the things you'll find if you uh read the book and i saw some people so if if, I, if someone can put the link in the chat for those that want to pre-order it I, I am intentional about defining terms and, and the reason i wanted to be real intentional about defining terms is so you'll know uh where i'm coming from uh as opposed to leaving it ambiguous and then mm -hmm. so so i think it's really important when we there are a lot of books coming out and it's just so important that we define terms so now we know where we're coming from as opposed to in, imposing my definition on you let the person speak for themselves and obviously you can still disagree um and i don't think all i don't think all disagreement is bad i think it can be healthy but yeah. uh, so I, I wanted to be intentional about that when pe some people will notice that when they begin to engage the book. Got you, got you. I, I wonder, you know, this is not a question, but you know, since somebody posted that, it's, she's she's made some similar statements a couple of times. So this is not a, to beat anybody up, but I do want to address it because it's in line with what we're talking about. Um, but she says, not a means of rebuttal or rebuke. Uh, we just don't see that same energy. Never seen a riot in the name of, of black on black crime. And, uh, you know, I think this is important that we address things like this, uh, you know, logically, you know, lovingly and logically. So, you know, when you think about it, uh, two, two things I want to say. When it comes to black and black crime, and, 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 and you know, Jerome, I, th I think you, you, you would agree with this here. I'm extremely confident that if a black person commits a crime, particularly of a violent sort, they go into jail. It, it, you know, they're either going to be you know, killed by the police, but more likely they're, they're going to go to jail. If you look at the statistics, our justice system does an exceptionally good job of prosecuting uh, African Americans, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you, we don't have a whole lot of people running free, doing crimes, and, and getting off of it. So the expectation, you know, when it comes to how our system deals with, with black criminals, is that they're, you know, they're going to go to jail. Now, when it comes to uh, police officers, particularly um, those who are, are Caucasian, um, there is not a great expectation that those who do wrong are going to meet justice. And the expectation is actually relatively low. I think many people, including myself, were, were actually surprised at the Derek Chauvin trial. I, I, I actually was 
I was relieved, but I was surprised that, that he actually got convicted of all counts. Um, you know, there have been other uh, uh, situations, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, and maybe not just Cosby, you know, think about Trayvon Martin or the Walter Scott case. You know, initially that one, I think he that kind of eventually went to jail, but initially it was a mistrial. You know, the, the expectations are, are relatively low when it comes to police officers being held accountable. And so I think the reason why we don't see the same energy when it comes to black on black crime that we do when it comes to you know officers of whatever color, I think the reason is quite frankly, um, well, at least one of the reasons is that, you know, when criminals do criminal stuff, they go, they get criminal consequences in the black community. But when it comes to officers, you know, criminals who wear a badge, we don't see that same thing. And so therefore people have, have a, a different reaction. Uh, the other side to it is, you know, and, and again, this is, goes back to something that, that you said, Jerome, the reality is I don't know anybody who's been louder about black on black crime than black people, particularly those in the church. You know what I'm saying? Um, when you think about, uh, shout out to, to Pastor Tyron Laws, pa shout out to uh, Pastor Rashad Armand. They, they told me about the three, maybe three or four years ago now that they and a group of other pastors have been boots on the ground in mm -hmm. Chicago on the corners where these murders and cr the crimes mm -hmm. are occurring, praying for people, preaching the gospel out there on a weekly basis. You never see that on the news. I wouldn't know about it if I didn't know somebody who was actually mm -hmm. involved. Shout out to, to Tyron Laws or shout out. We don't see those yeah. kind of things. Stop the violence rallies. Now, what people can point to is maybe when, you know, when it comes to rap music, look, Bro, I, I, I did gospel rap. I spent my whole career dissing rappers who were who were uh, perpetuating violence in our community. And I know, I mean, that, that's that's like nothing new. But when you look at the greatest, who's consuming that music more than any other group? Then you know, I'm not trying to be funny, but you know, black folks, when somebody releases an album, we gonna burn that joint. We gonna you know download it off YouTube. We we're not gonna buy it. The greatest consumer of violent music are is the Caucasian community. That's the reality of it. So there's a lot of different hands in the pot. When it comes to that particular expression of depravity, and I said all that to say that you don't often see those as those sides of the game, if you will, but there are people who are standing against uh, you know the violence, and unfortunately, the news is not interested in covering those kinds of things, and maybe that's yeah, something that, that we need to hold them accountable about. Yeah, yeah. And even though they say it, none of them. So this is conservative and and con uh, liberal. None of them are fair and balanced. They, they, none of them are. No, none of right. these news stations are truly fair and balanced. And so when you if you just begin to do your do your research, sister, and I think I get at the, the heart of what you're saying, sis, I agree with that we should never negate black responsibility. We're not. We're just saying we're saying, hey, just but again, because we talk about this, it doesn't mean that we're not doing things about these other issues. And trust me, if you do your research, you will see for decades we don't call it the black church didn't doesn't call it the black on black crime rally. It's hope for the block. Stop the violence, yeah. um, uh, or a block party. You know, there there have been churches in California doing things with Bloods and Crips for years that have yes. that have that have saved saved people out of gang culture. And so it's just important that the same way we're responding. And the second part, because she said, I don't see a riot. Well, we don't want a riot. We don't want yeah, well, a riot. Yeah. Right, we, right, right. we don't we we don't want a riot even when a cop gets off because destroying property destroying businesses we're not in, we're not advocating it that's not a good thing at all right right e even even if the cop should have been charged and he wasn't the response shouldn't be to riot so so that's what i would say to that right right it's good stuff it's good stuff uh somebody asked i think a really good question as a matter of fact um i think it's, i think it's a fair question um so i'm gonna put this over the screen it says one thing i can never understand is what response are you looking for from white christians subsequently what exactly are white Christians supposed to do in response, if anything? Now, I don't know that I, I you can't tell the tone behind how people ask questions, but you know, I, I think the question in and of itself is is a good one. Uh, because you know, we, we do want to be clear, and I think that's one thing I appreciate you, about your book. I said it earlier, is just the clarity with which you treat this issue. We do want to be clear about what it is that we're putting on the table. And um, so so anyway, you know, how, how would you respond to that? What what is it that you what are your expectations from your white brothers and sisters in Christ? So let me first say what it's not. I'm not looking for white guilt. That's manipulative and it doesn't Thank produce you. long. It doesn't produce uh, long lasting change. Amen. Uh, no, number two, my book is addressing, defining and giving you the historical primary sources of how we got here. Um, so when you say so, I'm not just looking for just just white Christians or white people, but I would say they're included in how we need to educate ourselves 
on the rich history of Christianity in Africa. We need to be intentional about showing the richness of that. And I'm not saying, again, the answer is not to blackwash. So I'm not saying only show black images. There are his, Hispanic theologians that we know nothing about, Asian and Indian theologians that we don't know nothing about because we keep starting church history at Wittenberg. That's one thing we can <laughs> stop doing. You, you can stop <laughs> stop starting church. And I'm not saying you. So Steve, see, I'm, I'm, gen, I'm being general. But let's stop starting church history at Wittenberg when you have centuries of African Christianity that precedes the Protestant Re Reformation. Let's learn how Ethiopian theologians in, uh, uh, impacted Martin Luther. I put that in the book. And so I'm saying we and so I have a chapter called Reform Theology versus Reform Culture. And I address some mm. of those issues and concerns. So I think I, I would say let's just present a fuller narrative of history. So I'm not saying only in, in exchange for whitewashing, let's go with blackwashing. I still I still reference, you know, I'm still going to reference white theologians that have impacted me. Um, but but you're going to see different images and you're going to hear about this history. And let's not just give one side. I also have several hopes. So there is some answers towards the back of the book, because, again, I end with a hopeful future, because, again, I hope is in the gospel of Christ. Uh, that's where I hope is him and him alone. And so uh, so you, you are provided with that in my book. Like, here's how we can stop whitewashing. Here's what we can. Here's a way forward. Here's what we can look at. Here are some things that we can do. Here's some introspective questions we can ask ourselves. Um, and that's provided in the book as well. So I appreciate that question, Steve C. Yeah, I thought that was a really good question, man. It gives the opportunity to, to um, you know, you know, dive into that. And you know, I think that I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna add to it a little bit. One thing I would like to see for all Christians, um, and, and you alluded to earlier, anytime you make a feature of who you are, the foundation of who you are, um, then you you inevitably you'll find yourself off course. That's I, that's how I've been, you know, I, I say it all the time. You know what I'm saying? And I think that we we can't lose sight of that because I, I'll be explicit. Right. When I'm dealing with comedics, when I'm dealing with, uh, you know, Hebrew Israelites, Moors, whatever, I'm going to approach their identity claims from an Imago Dei vantage point. Yeah. OK, that, that's that's my mode. I'm going to say, OK, look, the foundation of who you are is that you're made in the image of God. Exactly. Right? So when I go to dealing with the person who you know is promoting Christian nationalism, I'm going to go back to the Imago Dei. Right. I'm, I'm, I'm literally using the same scriptural vantage point to address that. And and I say to my friends all the time, I don't even think they realize. It. I was like, man, I, you you don't ever show up on my page unless I say something about America. You know what I'm saying? I, I could I could deal with Hebrew Israelites. I, I got 10 posts about Hebrew Israelism and not a word. But all of a sudden, if I if I talk about, you know, this you know historical fact, that historical fact about America, all of a sudden you coming out of the woodworks, you know. Now, what I'm trying to get at is for my for my brothers and sisters in Christ, you know what I'm saying, who you know just love America. I'm not saying you can't love America and, and have an appreciation for where you're from. You know, God bless you. That's what's up. But I'm just saying, I'm pointing you to the same thing. At the end of the day, the foundation of who we are as the Maga Day is the Imago Day. And that should be the anchor and the rudder that steers how we navigate these other aspects of our identity. You know what I'm saying now, to be honest with you, I think that. If, if we really approach that that way, then we find ourselves in a mental space, you know what I'm saying, that where we can stave off deceptions, right? I think there are certain ways that all nations deceive themselves. I think that's a feature of, of all nations, including America. You know what I'm saying? I think America has a, a propagandist narrative, as all nations do, that is askew mm -hmm. from the historical realities. Because America, just like Adam and Eve, I'm saying in all other nations, we have a tendency to fig leaf. We have a tendency to make coverings for ourselves and create narratives about ourselves that gloss over the, you know, the, the, the depravity, that total depravity that you're talking about. Right. And so I think, honestly, you know, you know I'm, I'm going to use an example. I'm, I'm, I'm probably, you know, it, feel free to log out. I'm about to say something controversial. So feel free to log out if you want, Jerome. You, you, I don't want you to you know, catch any arrows from what I'm about to say. But, <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, when you think about this idea, so many times I hear people say, oh, man, you know, America is it's the land of the free, it's the home of the brave, you know, it's, it's equal opportunity here. It's always been about equal opportunity and hard work and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, I'm going to have to research it. I think that's a relatively new idea. People actually holding to it. I don't think that most people throughout American history have actually really believed that. Right. And I'm going to tell you why. 
if you really believe that America is, is equal opportunity, I'm thinking about going back to the 60s, Jim Crow era and all that kind of stuff. If you really believe that, why in the world would you have to oppress a group of people for like 400 years? <laughs> like you like why would you need redlining if you really believe that you have every opportunity to make it in America and all you have to do is work hard if you believe that then you don't need to oppress you know your your American neighbor to get to where you're trying to go right so if you find if, if we find that there there are people who are instituting laws I'm not making this up like you know we have laws on the books that we can just look throughout the history and see how this economic policy or that that policy or that law disproportionately negatively impacted one group of people to the advantage of another, these things actually happen. And so what I'm saying is clearly those folks didn't really believe that America was free and, and equal opportunity, so on and so forth. They obviously didn't believe that because if they did, they wouldn't have to, they wouldn't have to, you know, cheat out somebody else. Right. So what I'm saying is what we have to realize is while I appreciate the principles uh, that that are uh, in line with God's word that, that America was founded on, and and certainly there are some certainly, and to a degree that was greater than than many other uh, nations. I certainly appreciate that, but at the same time, I'm just saying let's not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. We ought to, mm -hmm. because when we do that, we displace, you know, the, the gospel. We displace the grace of God in exchange for our own righteousness. That's not biblical, y'all. I don't care what kind of own righteousness that is, whether it be ethnic, national, whatever. You know what I'm saying it doesn't matter. You know I'm saying get rid of those things, get rid of those deceptions about yourself, those delusions of grandeur. See yourself through the lens of the Bible and look like and just realize we all need a savior, fam. I don't care what Fil color. Filthy like, rags. Filthy, filthy rags. rags. Come on, filthy man. Rags. Come on, man. So I got I, time I, for I one more, man. I yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, man. I, I was right, man. Let's, let's do one more. Uh anybody. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Here we go. Let's just uh, wait a minute. Uh, oh, Nate asked the question. So I, I got to get Nate because he's a he's a mod. Not sure if this is a relevant question, but given that all people are made in the image of God, does that make racism blasphemy? Oh, that's that's a good question. Actually, is it blasphemy? I I, I got to think about that. Yeah, I don't. I would. I mean, well, we know what blasphemy is. Mark three. So you know when when blasphemy is addressed in Mark three essentially is disbelief uh, or speaking against the Holy Spirit. Um, I, I'll say this, though. I'll say this is it is a social construct. But I, I, I say it's a social construct that we can't ignore. So the question the question is, yes, it is a social construct. But how do we address it? And that's where the big disagreement is. That's what a disagreement is, because people are uh, wrongly labeling anyone that brings up racist CRT, but then other people are too quick to call things racism that may not be. So I'm going to give you this. This is in the book, and I think this is worth the price of admission. All right. I I say now again, I, I get you. I, I get if you disagree with the term race or whatever, but but just go with me for a second. Mm -hmm. I say in, in order for us to stop wrongly labeling people. When we do have discussions on race, I say we need to think of it in a spectrum. And so there's racial ignorance. This is not knowing. And this could be based on proximity or another factors. But it's not racism. You don't know. There's racial indifference when, you know, there are people of this ilk who would just say, I, I don't care. This would this would somewhat be the colorblind crowd in some cases. Mm -hmm. There's racial insensitivity. This is when things are said and people are 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 put up in certain groups and there's assumptions about certain people, stereotypes. And then there's racism. And I think that if we can learn that people might be on this spectrum, maybe they're 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 ignorant. And I don't mean that in a derogatory. They generally don't know. So that's why, like when Steve C. ask ask a question, I don't think it's a loaded question. I don't think it's a microaggression. I think it's a legitimate question from yeah, from, from, from my from from my white brother whom I want to answer. Good question. So uh, yeah, you see what I'm saying? So I think we, we got to stop hopping over racial ignorance, racial indifference, racial sensitivity and calling everything racist because then you dilute it when it actually is. So to answer your question, I would say no based on the definition of blasphemy in Mark three. Uh, but I will I will concede that, yes, it is a social construct. And I, I, yeah. I address that in the book. I, I'm just of I'm I'm of the assertion that it's a social construct we can't ignore. And clearly, 
I, I don't see how someone can disagree with me on that because why are you doing whole conferences about critical race theory if there's no race? <laughs> right. you, you, you know what right, I'm saying? Right, so, right. so clearly it's something that we can't ignore. The question is, how do we answer it? My answer is the gospel. Um, and then the gospel has fruit. It, it has fruit. The gospel leads to works. We're not saved by works, but you know, there, there are works at a result as a result of us being saved. Got you guys. I think it's my brother CJ. Yo, shout, I just want to give him a shout out and say thanks for the uh uh for for this for the super chat. It's my my literal brother. <laughs> oh, okay, cool, CJ. Cool, yeah, cool, brother, cool. Uh, yeah, man. So I just want to say thank you. I'm sorry I kept you, you know, longer longer than we intended, man. I apologize for that, man. But uh, you know, you, you got bars, bro. So I, I had to get you in thanks. here, man. You know what I'm saying? Nah, my my pleasure, man. Definitely, my pleasure. Definitely. I want to encourage people. Thank you for this opportunity, uh, Adam. Again, uh, the subtitle, a hit, you know, the White Watch of Christianity, the subtitle, a hidden past, a hurtful present, and a hopeful future. Amen, I'm yeah. ending with hope. Right. It is never bleak for the believer because the tomb is empty and Come Christ on. has secured, Christ has secured our victory. So Amen. I am dealing with a lot of ugly history, but we, we're going to end with the reality that things are blissful in Christ. So we, we're not ending on a bleak note. We're ending on a blessed note because of what Christ has done. Amen. Amen. Well, I just want to say, brother, you know, I appreciate you. You know what I'm saying? I, you know, I got a copy of the book and I'm, I'm working my way through it, man. I'm, I'm just been astounded at the scholarship, uh, the solid argumentation. Uh, it's, you know, just very clear in terms of your definitions and, and what it is that you're tackling, man. And, and it's just a, a really great work, man. I just want to say, I appreciate you. I appreciate the time that, uh, certainly you, you had put in a great deal of time, uh, to bring this out, man. And just, uh, just in general, man, just, you, you've been a real good brother to me, bro. Um, you know, thank you, man. we've had a lot of conversations. You've encouraged me on several different occasions. So I was going to say publicly say thank you for that you know, as well, man. So, um, with that being the case, y'all, we're going to sign on out. Uh, definitely check out my man, uh, Jerome Gay. Uh, his book is, uh, I think it's wherever books are sold, right? No, I got mine off of Amazon. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I see somebody asked about pre order. If somebody can, can put the link in the chat, um, it's on Amazon. Amazon only has the hardcover right now, but if you go right. to Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Nobles, you have the hardcover or the uh, paperback. And so Barnes and it's at Walmart, Target, it's it's everywhere. Um, so so yeah, you, you can go there. And I appreciate I appreciate the support. I, I appreciate the engagement, and I yes, I appreciate the critique too. I'm good with hey, it. All. I heard that. I heard it. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good with it all. Respect, man. Yeah. That's 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 dope, man. That's, that's great humility right there, bro. So uh y'all know what it is, man. You know, we don't shy away from hard questions here on on the channel, man. And we brought in a, a great brother to address this stuff and, and uh, tackle it head on. So I just want to say I appreciate you, bro. And y'all know what it is, man. Uh the, actually, there we go. The, the link is in the chat. Uh, for anybody, uh, you know, I'll just say everybody go get the book. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and the link is in the chat right there. So you can go ahead and cop that, man. I have, and I'm, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying it. So I want to say I love y'all. Y'all know what it is. Love God, love people. Think, um, and take care of the things that God blesses you with. Peace. Peace.